How's it going? Damon Edwards here. Um, by the way, uh, I don't know if you all know Igor and the organizers of this event, but uh, they do a fantastic job. And it's pretty hard to do in-person events this, uh, this time, and especially trying to make a living at it. So uh, hats off to them. I think we should give them a round of applause for uh, <laughs> making this happen. And uh, make sure you tell all your friends about future events so they can all uh, feed their families. <laughs> it's a good thing. So uh, my talk, you know, I, a lot of automation talks, these events are very specific, right? So here's a specific tool to do the specific thing. Um, this is a little different talk. This is about, uh, you know, strategy and focus, right? Where do we apply our automation efforts to actually get the most value? So everybody's, everybody's, uh, everybody's happy. Uh, I said before, I'm, uh, I'm Damon Edwards. Um, so I've been a pretty lucky, I think for this crowd to consider it lucky, uh, view of the world the past, uh, you know, 15 years or so. Used to be a managing partner of a um, operations consulting company. We're early on in, involved in, uh, in the DevOps world. Um, I've seen it a lot of early conference speaking, conference organizing as part of the original kind of DevOps days global committee. Used to do a podcast called DevOps Cafe with John, John Willis. Got to see inside a lot of very interesting companies. Uh, we built a automation tool company called Rundeck. Um, just sold it to, uh, to PagerDuty actually during the pandemic. Um, it's quite nice. Now the foundation of uh, part of PageDuty's automation business. Uh, if you don't know PageDuty, we're an automation company. Um, we mostly focus on incident response, right? Critical work. How do you get people to the right place at the right time and empower them to take to take action to keep things uh, to keep things running? We got a booth somewhere over there. Uh, I suggest go visiting them. So, uh, or visiting us, I should say. Now, um, how many of you seen this sticker before? Right? This is like a popular you automate all the things, right? You know, it, it's a cool ethos, right? I like it. It makes you know we should always be thinking about an automation mindset. But the reality is, it's not that practical, right? You know, there is a serious limitation to, we only have so much time, we only have so many people, right? We only have so many skills sitting around, right? So it becomes this kind of mismatch where you see inside a lot of companies, you talk to people, you know, in the trenches, right? Hands on the keyboard. They're like, oh, we got all kinds of automation. Automation's everywhere. We're bringing new automation tools in. It's automation, automation all the time, right? Then you talk to somebody two, three, four degrees away from the keyboard, and they go, eh, nothing's automated. Right? We spend all this money, but we're not seeing any benefit on this. Things don't feel that much different to us, right? Yeah, maybe somebody's 10%, 20% more efficient, but we're not seeing big impact uh, as, a, as a company, right? So the question is, you know, where do we focus? Where do we prioritize, right? How do we get that alignment to where we're automating the things that are gonna make our lives better in the trenches, but also make the business better at the same, at the same time? And you know, we're seeing this trend emerge in companies where the focus is really on customer satisfaction, right? Saying what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis for automation, how are we driving the impact on customer satisfaction? So I'm gonna spend the rest of the time kind of drilling in on that, that thesis and kind of how that, how that works, right? So we think about customer satisfaction, right? The broadest kind of you know, cartoon conception here. What is it that keeps customers happy, right? Number one, building the service that they want, right? Delivering the features that they, that they or they think they want, right? Um, the second part is keep those things working flawlessly, right? Now, yes, yes, I know, right? Failure is inevitable, flawlessly is possible. From a customer perspective, that's what they want, right? We, they want it to where, you know, when they want it, it performs the way that they, um, the way that they want it. So, you know, the build of services they want, that's a different conference talk, <laughs> right? So what I wanna focus really on is on the operational side of this, right? How do you keep, how do you keep it performing, right? How do, you, how do you align your work in that arena and the automation in that arena towards driving that customer satisfaction, which drives the better, business um, outcomes. So kind of clicking in on that, you know, there's just sort of three constituencies, right, that uh, I think are pretty obvious when it comes to the keep it performing side of things. And the work that happens in these three areas, um, not necessarily three different teams, but in more and more cases, you'll see where that's sort of functionally aligned. You know, you've got the dev, the build work, right? You've got the operations work, and you've got uh, customer service often forgotten about over there. So first one I want to talk about is the, obviously we're at a DevOps conference, right? Let's talk about the DevOps uh, divide, you know, if you go back, you know, once upon a time, there was these hard walls between, you know, developers and operators, right? In fact, it wasn't uncommon, I don't know if anyone remembers this part, where uh, developers didn't even know what production looked like, right? They had some Word document that told them, like, what it might be, right? But they never saw it, right? It was just somewhere else, right? And you had the operators um, that had all the accountability, right? Meaning that it was always on them. That's how they became the VPs of no, right? Because it was like, you know, it was, all the pressure was on them but they had none of the control. All the control was living in the dev side who didn't even really know what was going on <laughs> in operations, right? So because of that, these walls built up, right? 
And of course, while we're all here, right, there was the DevOps movement, right, which is really about how do we build these high velocity de delivery life cycles, these feedback loops where we can kind of break down those silos and start to move these two um, actions together, right? And we often see it where it goes even a step further. And now we're, you know, kind of no longer there's a separate organization. We're even trying to build you run it, build you build it, you run it teams and really align how work, um, how work happens. Um, and then, you know, more recently, uh, there's sort of the operations kind of response or the operations getting on board with the DevOps movement. And we have this thing called SRE, right? And I'll talk a few minutes about that and I promise I'll bring it back to, uh, to customer satisfaction. But, you know, if you think about a lot to be said about SRE, but what really sets it apart? What makes it defining what's different between SRE and uh, traditional operations? And Stephen Thorne, who's one of the key authors in the, um, uh, the site reliability engineering book from Google, right? They pretty much, you know, uh, they define this, uh, this practice, said, you know, there's a lot of things people say and do and say, this is our SRE, this is not our SRE, but in their mind, what are the three principles that set SRE across from, um, apart from operations, right? Uh, number one, you know, SRE needs service level objectives with consequences, right? Let's kind of drill in on that. So, you know, we're used to the concept of SLAs, right? SLAs are these external agreements that we make with people that, that you know, we're going to be in trouble or pay a penalty if we don't deliver some something to a customer uh, at a certain at a certain level. SLOs are a bit different. They're looking uh, kind of more internally at, you know, what is the qualities of the service that we need to to maintain? That is our and we'll measure it somehow. It's our service level indicator, and we'll define this service level objective, right? And interesting enough, you know, it's not like saying uptime must be 100 percent. Right? It's like, well, what do customers, what will they really, what will they really um, put up with? Right? What does the business really need here? Being realistic about that definition. And then everything that's above that becomes, we call this air budget, meaning that we don't have to overachieve. Those extra nines cost you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars a year to try to, uh, to try to achieve. If we don't need it, let's consider that air budget, meaning let's use that. Let's push it, let's push the systems, let's push forward. And as long as we're above that service level objective, we're within our air budget, we haven't blown it, we've still, we've still got it. And what's very fascinating about this is really the consequences part of this, which is saying, we're using this as a way to define shared responsibility across the, across the life cycle. So no longer it's, hey, operations, they have the accountability for uptime, right? You can say, hey, there's this service level objective we have to maintain. And if we go below it, if we break it, it's not just operations concern, it's everybody's concern. Meaning if we have to stop pushing new features, if we have to tell the business, hey, we're you know, slowing things down, um, it's become the thing that the entire organization aligns on, we're gonna work at this particular, uh, particular level. And you'll even see you know, people go as far as saying, hey, there's actual you know, consequences. Like in the Google model, we say theoretically, the SRE team could turn an application back to development team, saying we're no longer caring for your application because you're way out of whack with your service level objectives. Now, talking to folks who actually work there, no one's ever can recall where that's actually happened, right? But the threat of it keeps everybody sort of thinking about, oh, wait a minute, this is a serious thing, right? We have to respect this and we have to align around, around operational excellence as a business because our business is operating services, right? Our business is not developing software, our business is running the service based on those uh, softwares. We could buy all the software off the shelf, we probably would, right? But that's uh, a different story. So uh, these other two principles, I think, are very much interrelated. Number one, SREs have time to make tomorrow better than today, right? So it means you have built-in capacity where traditional operations, you're always treading water, right? You're always behind. There's always way more problems to fix. And you don't get time to actually stop and fix the things that you need to do to improve things in the future, right? So by definition, an SRE program has to have the feedback mechanisms in place to um, make tomorrow better than today. And the SRE teams need to have the ability to regulate their workflow, they need to have, I mean, their workload, they need to have the feedback mechanisms, have things in place so they can actually push back when um, their capacity is being overblown. And it's really just kind of, I think, one of the, one of the greatest uh, uh, contributions of the SRE movement to the world is just putting a name on this thing we've always known about, which is toil, right? And toil is the stuff that gets in the way from doing the work that matters, right? So this definition uh, from Vivek Rao, um, I think it's pretty great. It's toil is the kind of work tied to running a production service that tends to be manual, right? Someone's gotta go do it. Repetitive, right? We do it over and over again. Automatable, meaning like we should be able to have a computer do it, but we don't, we have humans doing it. Um, doesn't require extra thinking or extra sort of gray matter. Um, Tactical, right? 
devoid of enduring value. That's really, I think, the key word because it's like there's things we got to do day in, day out. And if we don't do it, the system will fall over, right? Um, but it's not adding enduring value, right? It's, so it's really a waste. I mean, it's just something we should automate away. It should be repetitive. Yes, it's necessary because the business will fail if we don't do it. But we should be looking at that as that's not good. That's toil in our system. And a good way to know if you've got it or not is this a scale, you know, linearly, right? So, you know, picture your services that you run in your, in your business today, the number of users you have, right? Factor it times 10, right? Do you have to add more people to run it because your, your business is scaled 10, 100, 1,000 times? If, it, if the work that has to done to maintain it scales with the load on your system, you've got toil in the, uh, in the, uh, in the system. And, you know, the opposite of toil is the notion of engineering work. Engineering work adds value to the business, requires creativity, requires human beings. It, encable, it, it, uh, it in encourages or in, uh, enables scaling, right? And why this is so important is engineering work has really two aspects to it. One is uh, the ability to um, improve the business, right? The second is it's your, it's your investment to be able to re reduce that toil, right? And if things get out of whack and on these operations, you know, oriented teams, if the toil level pushes out that engineering work, you effectively hit this bankruptcy, right? Where you don't, not only don't have the capacity to improve the business, but you don't have the capacity to reduce toil. You're stuck in this downward, this downward spiral that is, um, that is inevitable, right? So, you know, these two here about, you know, SREs having time to make tomorrow better than today. SRE teams have the ability to regulate their workload. It's all around managing that toil and having the systems in place to spot it, to know when we have to swarm to, uh, to fix it, to give them the capacity to do those, to do those things. And if you think about it, what's, I think what's actually even more interesting about this, it's really a customer satisfaction focus added to operations, right? So service level objectives, right? We're actually agreeing on measuring what matters to our business, what matters as a customer. The consequences part means we're aligning everybody to it, right? And the idea of making tomorrow better than today, having the capacity and the ability to regulate your workload, that's all about protecting the capacity to maintain and improve um, what, you're, what you're doing, right? So effectively, it's about how do we achieve what we need to achieve as a business from a customer satisfaction perspective? How do we align the business to it? How do we and create the capacity to actually make it happen? So to me, it's like, you know, this is really injection of customer service thinking into our customer satisfaction thinking into our um, into operations, right? And so, you know, if that's what we're trying to drive here, we say we're using the SRE mechanism, the SRE system as a way to drive, um, you know, this customer satisfaction thinking, where can we focus our automation efforts to make this SRE uh, transformations, SRE thinking impactful, right? And there's really two ways. One is applying it to the ability, improving the ability to respond, improving the ability of, as a team to, re to respond quicker and learn, right, from, uh, from these, these incidents, right? Feed those feedback loops. And the other is applying automation to reduce the toil to create that additional work capacity, right? So we can definitely look at it and say, if these are two areas, if we're putting our, this lens on, is this automation thing, we, thing we wanna automate, is it helping us in one of these two, one of these two, two areas? And sort of a secondary thesis of this talk is that self-service is really the key to unlocking um, uh, both of these things, to improving the ability to respond and also reduce the toil um, to create additional work capacity. So this notion of self-service automation, or really what's it all about? Number one, it's about enabling people to do what previously only subject matter experts could do, right? So often there's things that, oh, there's an issue here. Well, what are you gonna do? Well, who knows this best? Oh, Susan knows it best, right? So we're gonna call up Susan. Where's Susan? Susan's not here. Okay, we get Bob, right? Bob looks at it and goes, oh, wait a minute, that's an application problem, right? And then and they say, okay, let's go to the app team, right? And the app team says, no, there's no data. It's a database problem, right? And the database team says, wait a minute, you know, it's a, uh, uh, there's no network connectivity between these two services, right? It's a network problem. So we've bounced around, wasted everybody's time, um, all because, you know, we, we don't have that, there's subject matter experts that can diagnose or fix those problems. So uh, by enabling people to do what other people previously had to do, you now can, uh, enable teams to take action, right? Respond uh, quicker to an incident or uh, reduce those escalations, right? Hey, let's run all the diagnostics. If it's those 10 people we would call in, uh, let's run those as the first responder, right? Or during non-incident non times, during general you know, project work, all those little things that you gotta open a ticket for and wait in line for somebody else to do for you, how do you turn those into self-service so people can, can help themselves, right? Not only is it a quicker instant turnaround time for the person who needs something, um, but it also stops all the interruptions and keep pushing into the organization. You know, how many times people bother you for the same thing over and over again, you finally get all that off your plate 
and then you turn around, you're opening a ticket for somebody else to do something, and now you're you're waiting, right? So as much as you can enable, you know, the self-service uh, automation through that, you're able to get rid of you know shorter incidents, fewer escalations, uh, whatnot. And also it maximizes that return on the automation investment, right? So you see a lot of investment in task-specific automation, right? Moving the bits from point A to point B, or generating a configuration, or hitting some, some API. And often it's like a tool for a certain subset of experts, right? It's something hey, they've created so they can work faster. When the ticket hits them, they can get it done. Or when the Slack you know, pokes them, they can get something done a little bit faster. Um, and that's great. We need to build that layer of, of automation. But by enabling self-service on top of that, you're enabling other people to leverage that same automation. Now you can fundamentally change how the organization works, right? You can spread the operational load around. Um, you can, you know, chain, move the work to where it needs to be done, and you, uh, you know, satisfy people without that that constant um, interruption. So, some examples that we see when people take this sort of self-service, you know, mindset. One is, you know, on the development side, finally, you know, fully enabling the you build it, you run model, right? Not just having a CI. Um, you know, process that, or a CD process that gets them through to, to production, but actually, how do you actually move operational control, especially in larger organizations, regulated environments, how do you move it so you can actually allow people to participate in operations activity? So, you know, running diagnostics in production, you know, doing different maintenance, maintenance tasks, investigation tasks, you know, redeploying things, fixing things. How do you enable that without, you know, saying, hey, here's your SSH key and some scripts and pseudo privileges and, you know, say a prayer, right? Uh, you know, and also the developers, few interruptions coming back their way, right? How many times somebody like, hey, uh, you know, why is your app so slow? Like, I don't know, I don't know, right? <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about, right? Or, or what happens to do this? Or, hey, we need to rescale that. Or, you know, so you basically, it's that stopping those escalations back. If I can empower people and say, hey, here is how you tell this application is healthy. And hey, here is how you do this basic, you know, vocabulary of things you need to do. I can hand it off to other teams. They can actually go and take action themselves lets me be in my zone, lets me lock out a lot of that operational um, uh, concern. Um, you know, useful access to sensitive environments. This happens all the time. It's like, you build it, you run it, it's great, right? It's like, okay, we're gonna go fix that. It's like, no, you're not, right? There's customer data over there. You can't get over there because some regulatory reason or whatever. But if you give them self-service automation, you're not giving them technically access to that environment. You see the compliance teams will actually get on board of this because they're like, oh, you're not actually giving somebody access to an environment with customer data in it. You're giving them, you know, access to this automation that will go and do tasks um, task for them. And obviously the one is, you know, stop waiting in ticket queue for everything that you, that you need time and time and time out. Right. And so on the off side, it's, you know, spreading the operational load, right? If I, Hey, if I can set this stuff up, I don't have to constantly feel these repetitive requests. I can say, Hey, go help yourself. Here's the button to go, to go do it. Um, it's so eliminates repetitive requests, you know, um, you know, you can do the expert diagnostics without escalating, right? Instead of saying, Hey, uh, I got to, Every incident, I got to put off this call to all the on calls to come in and they do the it wasn't me dance, right? And then they have to sit while somebody squirms in the hot seat. And then, you know, they've lost their whole morning, they get a cup of coffee, and now they're at lunch and you've missed half a missed half a day, right? But if you can enable people with the expert diagnostics themselves, say, hey, here's the buttons you hit, this will, you know, give you the uh, the health checks and all the systems. We can now get rid of all those, es those extra escalations, focus on. Uh, you know, very specific uh, pinpoint escalations. And it gives a way to standardize on our internal best practices, right? That, you know, Susan was the best person to diagnose that problem. Susan's not always around. How do we take Susan's knowledge and build a standard uh, automated checklist, standard operating procedures for how we would how we would do things? And so all that adds up to, you know, from an organizational perspective, fewer interruptions in waiting, right? Which means less toil, more engineering capacity, right? Everybody loves that from the people with the hands on the keyboard to the boss that's trying to figure out how to get more out of a team. And, you know, faster resolution and learning, right? So, you know, basically um, through this automation, a better response to problems, we can respond quicker um, uh, to the problems that we haven't yet engineered, um, engineered away. It becomes a virtuous cycle. So, you know, that's the kind of the, the traditional, we think, we think operations, we think the dev and ops side. Um, there's a, that sort of that third partner here in the customer satisfaction world, and that's the customer service world, right? Often overlooked. Um, it's funny, their dev and ops divide, like we used to have 10 years ago, is kind of there for them, right? Uh, they're the ones that get screamed at, right? Like, like they're accountable to the customer. Like the customer's happiness falls directly onto them. You know, we have bad CSAT scores, right? Must be a customer service problem. Customers yell at them, right? When something goes, something goes wrong. But they have none of the insight or control over the services, right? That's all, you know, us on the other side of the, uh, the other side of the wall, right? So, 
um, you know, they're in the constant world of, hey, especially in this kind of complex distributed world we're in today, is there really an issue with this system? Customers complaining, is it really, is it our problem? Don't know, right? Um, is this related to other issues that we've, that we've got, right? Um, how do I gather the details to reproduce it? Right, I can't just say, oh, it's, they say the shopping cart app's broken, right? Or the funds transfer services isn't, you know, isn't doing what it's supposed to do. How do I gather those details and uh, provide those in a meaningful way to um, folks on the other side of the house? And then there's terrible catch-22, right? Which is if you don't throw up an alarm and escalate, uh, you frustrate the customer, right? But if you throw up the alarm and, es and escalate, half the time you get yelled at, by other folks saying that's not a problem, right? And they close it and they get mad at you for doing that, right? So they're in, this, they're in this weird position. And the worst of all, it's kind of a thankless job. So the accumulated expertise continuously walks out the door, right? So if you get people that are experts, they know how to do these things, they're gone, right? Um, so they have to build very kind of guardrails and very focused ways of, 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 uh, of doing things. Highly ineffective. And there's a huge you know, loss there that people feel, people are okay with problems if they feel heard, right? They're entering psychological aspect of it. You see like the very high end hotels, like the Four Seasons, those things, they've really said that they know problems are gonna happen, sort of a kind of an ops mindset, um, but they really focus on making the customer feel heard and making them understand that there is a resolution coming and we are working on it very, very diligently. So it's a huge, benefit to have that team plugged into what is going on, on the operation side of the house. But today that wall is, um, is there to the point where it's almost useless, right? It becomes a game of telephone passing back and forth. So, you know, we see people that same self-service automation that we were applying on the dev and ops side, right? To reduce toil, to get rid of the repetitive requests, to enable people to work, to work faster, use that same mechanisms to, to, to give certain capabilities, right? To directly to these customer service teams, right? So the ability to instantly validate an issue, right? Is there actually run these health checks? I actually see is there an issue with the, the system, you know, automatically capturing um, environment data uh, to, to enrich a case. Often state is a big deal, right? So, you know, the, the batch job finished running and everything went back to normal. So by the time that gets routed to you that there's a problem, you look at everything and you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Everything's fine, right? Because at the point where there was a perceived problem, you know, nobody actually captured the state of what was working in the system. Uh, we've seen a lot of times where uh, big problems, um, when they were still little problems, escape everybody because of that timing mismatch between when a complaint comes in and when uh, the problem self-resolves itself until that day that the problem doesn't self-resolve itself and we have a massive, you know, a massive, uh, a massive issue. So that's an easy early warning mechanism. Um, you, know, you know, basic processes like checking in account states or checking the, of a system or um, you know, sometimes even going ahead and doing it, uh, basic administrative capabilities that we would never think to give a customer service team today. If you can constrain them and give them certain guardrails, um, the ability to give them that self-service automation to actually do things that will, you know, keep keep the workload off of um, off of our uh, dev and ops teams, and all that adds up to you know faster response, right? How do we get better answers uh, to our customers quicker? Getting more done, right? Uh, you know, less toil. Uh, they suffer on this toil problem as well. Um, and you know, being able to handle more cases and um, you know mitigate the uh, the uh, the turnover uh, that they have to uh, they have they have to deal with, right? These are all very very important. So same kind of self service efforts. So thinking about it, it's like, well, okay, wh what gets in the way of people's self service efforts uh, today? And we see the same problem over and over again, which is you know, there's all these sort of call them individual component or task specific automation efforts, right? It's like, oh, we've automated this little deployment or this configuration or this failover process. There's all these little kind of pieces that we've, that we've um, automated. But effectively what we've done is we've created tools for those experts to do their jobs faster, right? And to really, to get the real benefit out of that automation, how do we let other people in the organization uh, you know, leverage that same automation? If just, we don't need to escalate, we don't need to you know, phone a friend, um, uh, we can you know, share the operational load and we can get things done, done faster. But there's these gaps, right? There's these kind of three gaps that, that come into play time and time again. One is the knowledge gap, right? It's like, hey, I, you know, I kind of know how this firewall stuff works, <laughs> right? But I'm not a firewall expert, so, and I don't really know how things are configured today. So I can sort of, I just got to shove it off to somebody who knows the current state of things. Often even in the same teams, right? Just, I, I don't know what's the latest version of this service or how do I run this particular script? Was it dash A or dash I, or was it, you know, do I have to edit this file to, to, to target things? You know, it's, it's that kind of constant current state knowledge is, is missing. 
um, there's often a, uh, a skills gap, right? Just like, hey, we've got folks who aren't skilled in this, in this area, right? It could be a technical thing like, hey, you're a network engineer or other people aren't. It could be more like we have these business analysts that you know, do things for this. You know, they want to enable them to provision things for when we spin up new partners, right? Stuff like, stuff like that. We have these gaps in, in skills. And then we also have just access gaps, right? Compliance comes in and says, hey, you just can't, you got to draw these boxes in this organization. You can't give these people access to this environment because of these regulatory, um, regulatory reasons, right? So these tend to get in the, uh, get in the way. And so when we do see automation efforts, uh, self-service automation efforts take place, it's for very specific things like, hey, we know how to do it for, um, you know, app deployment, right? Or we've spent all this effort to build it for some particular like content operation thing. Um, it doesn't really spread beyond that because it's such a heavy lift to try to conquer these different uh, knowledge gap, the skills gap, the access gap, to build the system and the guardrails in place to get it to get it done. So, um, you know, something that we started back in our run deck days and we're continuing, um, you know, at PageDuty is the idea of, of you know, a self-service platform, right? We use, you know, uh, runbook automation uh, for this, but it's about baking in the things into the platform that make it easy to actually enable that self-service, right? One is, you know, make it easy to, uh, to leverage existing tools and languages, right? This idea that you're going to go in into an organization and say, like, everybody must use this scripting language. Everybody must use this automation tool, right? Trying to prematurely um, standardize on things never seems to really go, go well, right? What goes well is focusing on how do you let people bring the tools and skills that they have with them? You know, that team's all PowerShell over there. That team's all Ansible over there. Right, that team hates Ansible. They're all Python, right? And those folks, and there's bash, bash, bash everywhere. You know, everywhere around the, around the world that nobody wants to admit is there, but it, it just works, right? So, how do you leverage that? How do you say, hey, we're just going to let people plug in the stuff they have that that works? And this great concept that one of our community members came up with was mean time to button, right? How quickly can you take the stuff that moves the bits around and push that together and put put it together by configuration and turn it into a button that somebody else can can use. And the key part there is you got to kind of break it into the life cycle of, of how people work. So you're enabling self-service for the self-service creation, right? If you say, hey, we got to have some other team come in and build this complex thing for you, it's just never going to happen, right? Um, but if you say, hey, you know, in this easy way, take the stuff you know how to do, drop it in this system. Now we can, you know, have self-service move on, right? Um, you know, fine grained access control and logging, right? Um, you know, obviously there's just management concerns like, hey, we just got to be careful of who's doing what. Um, but this is a great way to make compliance your friend. Because right now you think about it, their world is, oh, we've got all these, this ticket that goes through this, you know, ITIL inspired process and then it gets approved. And then, and then it finally gets to somebody's hands on the keyboard and they just write done, right? And then it's gone. And they're like, what did you do? I have no idea, <laughs> right? So being able to define fine grained access and control at that platform level, um, not only makes it easy for you to be able to give out access where it's where it's needed, but it also gets the compliance and security folks on your side, and this becomes their um, their friend. Where in the past, the idea of self service would freak them freak them out, right? Uh, you got to have something that knows about your infrastructure. So one of the hardest things about that knowledge gap is knowing how to target automation. Like, I'm going to run this stuff on all of these services that are currently you know tagged foo, right? Well, you know who knows that's is that one instance today? Is it 100? Is it here? Is it there? What clouds are running in? Um, so being able to have a resource model as part of the system that knows where things are, learns from your different infrastructure pieces, and then it can inject basically how do you target stuff, as well as what current variables do I need, right? Do I need to know a certain path? Do I need to know a certain number? Do I need to know some kind of API key? You know, have a system that helps you understand your, uh, your infrastructure model. And the last one is, you know, the workflow, the error handling, the notification, all the stuff that's actual hard programming work, right? So again, you're going to find massive amounts of, uh, of skills in your organization around the, you know, I said the, the, the moving the bits, the, uh, you know, the hitting the APIs, the transforming stuff, right? That, everybody knows how to script that, but it's the workflow on top of that, forking, forking and merging, merging processes. You know, if you're in production, do this. If you're in QA, do that, right? Um, the ability to, if this fails, try this first and then bail out, right? Or if it fails, just forget about that and keep moving, right? Um, and then go back and try it again later, just doing the things that failed, right? Uh, how do you notify people of things, right? Um, you know, all of this is, uh, becomes hard programming work, right? If you try to layer it on top of your scripting layer, but instead focus on building that into a platform, then, you know, it becomes a configuration effort, not a programming effort, right? And that's how you can encourage that, that, uh, that self-service as you go. So, you know, those are the kind of the sort of four sort of key um, capabilities that we see that 
anyone who's building uh, you know self service um, uh, automation um, system um, they have to you know they have to uh, they have to account for. So recap uh, you know disjointed automation effort it's bad ROI right. Um, I think focusing on customer satisfaction is a great way to focus the business and uh, you know engineering and operations on the same things. Justify automation programs, uh, uh, automation you know efforts. Know you know how you're how you're getting somewhere, something to measure. Um, remember that operational impacts this whole organizational effort, right? The dev, the ops, and the customer service. Um, I think SRE is a great way to bring that customer satisfaction focus to the dev and ops um, to the dev and ops game. Uh, you know, self-service automation is you know a key way to accelerate that SRE transformation, right? Eliminating autom uh, toil interruptions, waiting. It's super useful in both the emergency incident context and also the peacetime uh, project work context. Um, you know, self-service automation, um, just like it could transform your SRE efforts, um, is a great way to actually bring customer service for real into uh, the operational life cycle, elevate you know the customer satisfaction side of things. And be careful of sort of the ad hoc attempts, right? Often fail because of these gaps and how expensive it is kind of on a one-off basis to overcome those gaps. Um, taking more of a platform approach, looking at like things like runbook automation tools um, can really help you get to that rapid um, success. So that's my talk. Uh, if anyone wants to talk about this, um, you can email me, um, hit me up on Twitter if that's your thing. Uh, we actually got a booth, I think, one of those little side rooms over there, PagerDuty. We're green, uh, you'll notice it everywhere. Um, and uh, look forward to hearing about your experiences and uh, helping out however we can. Thank you very much. Have a good one.